Hi everybody, uh, welcome in my presentation, what everybody ought to know about Airflow. That's a pretty um, great question, but I would like to start with the following image. So this is the data engineering ecosystem in 2023, and you can imagine that we have more tools today than that. And this is overwhelming, like as a data engineer, we need to, um, you know, deal with those tools and understand like how they work. This is really overwhelming. In fact, if we do the math, we can expect to have at least seven different tools in our data stack. Usually it's more than that. We can expect like at least one release every quarter with roughly like 30 improvements, new features, bug fixes and so on. So at the end of the year, we are supposed to know this big number of things because they will help us in some way. And that's not doable. So that's why in the next 25 minutes, I want to give you a big update about Airflow as it is today. What are the new features and why they are important for you? So you don't have to spend hours yourself to know about them. But we are not going to go through like a list of new features and so on. It will be a little bit boring in my opinion. Instead, we are going to create our data pipeline, our first data pipeline, like if you knew what is, com what is coming next in this presentation. So let's begin. I think we all have been there, you know, with uh, clunky data pipelines, errors everywhere, no monitoring, obviously, and so our Monday mornings are gone because usually things to tend to break over the weekends because otherwise it, it won't be funny. And it's at that time you realize that you need a tool like Airflow. And obviously your eyes are shining, you can't wait to put your hands on Airflow. And for a long time, you had three options. The first one was by using pip install, but it's manual, not that convenient. You can do it, but again, it will take you a little bit more, more time. Then if you use the Docker Compose way with just two commands, you are able to run Airflow locally. But you have to use Docker. And if you had the Kubernetes cluster, then you can go with the Helm chart. I believe there are two other ways that I think are faster and easier to use. And the first one is by using the Astro CLI. So the Astro CLI is an open source project. Anybody can use it. And just by executing a few commands, like three commands, you end up with that project and you have a fully functional local Airflow development environment following best practices. You can see you have the folders you need, then some files that will help you to store your variables, connections, and so on, so you don't have to recreate those things again and again and again when you break your development environment. But what if you don't have Docker? Because Docker is nice, but for Windows users, I know for a fact that it doesn't work that well. Well, you can use the Airflow CTL. Airflow CTL is a tool, again, it's an open source project that my friend Kexil did like two weeks ago, and it's just amazing. So you don't have to use Docker, and again, with the Airflow CTL, you are able to create your local Airflow development environment following best practices, because you have you know, all of those files and folders for you. And by the way, you will be able to manage multiple Airflow projects by using the Airflow CTL. Okay, so let's say we go with the Airflow CTL or the Astro CLI, it's up to you. But what next? Well, you need to configure your Airflow instance. And something that I believe I will always enable going forward is this setting. You know when you fetch a variable outside of a task that makes a connection to your database each time the DAG is parsed? But the problem is if you have a lot of DAGs that do that, you will end up with a lot of connections to your database and so you can impact dramatically the performance of parsing your DAX. You know, you know when your DAX take longer and longer to be parsed? That might be due to the useless connections you make to your database and so on. So with that configuration setting, now you can fetch the values you need from a cache instead of the database directly. So that will be extremely helpful if you want to improve the, perform the performances of your Airflow instance. Okay, so the configuration is done. You run Airflow and you land on this Beautiful user interface. It's beautiful, isn't it? I think there are two things that stand out here. The filters, running and failed. You know, 
in the real world, because obviously we are in the presentation here, but in the real world, you have a lot of data pipelines. And what you care about is those that are in failure. And with those filters, now you are able to quickly filter on the data pipelines that are in failure or that are running. But I think we are more interested by those that are in failure. So you can do that pretty quickly. You don't have to go through a ton of pages to know which one are in failure. And then you have, obviously, the auto-refresh that was amazing. Uh, now you can keep track on the states of your DAG runs and data pipelines and task instances, actually, without having to eat the F5 button, you know, like crazy, which is nice. OK, so the UI is beautiful. I think it's time to create our first data pipeline together. And I know it's a simple example. It's a presentation. Usually it's much harder than that. But you will see that with that data pipeline, we are going to discover a few things, a very interesting few things. So let's begin with how would we create that data pipeline together? Usually, usually you will do something like that. You know, you create your tasks with the Python operator. Then you want to share data between your tasks with XCOMs. Pretty simple. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it is simple, but it's quite straightforward maybe. But it's a lot of code just to create three tasks, isn't it? And there is a better way than that. Actually, you can use the task free API. And the task free API is another way to author your data pipelines without all the boilerplate code that you can see here. You see with the Python operator, the task ID, the Python callable, and so on, all of that stuff that you need to write again and again and again. So what can you do instead? Well, with the task free API, you can first import the decorators, because with the task free API, you are not going to use like the classic operators anymore. You will use the decorators. So it's much faster to write and easier to read. So you import your decorators, and then you define your workflow. Nothing new here. We are just using the DAG decorator with the usual parameters. Speaking of the DAG definition, um, you don't have to use those notations anymore. You know, with the DAG equals to your uh, DAG object, and then you assign the variable to every uh, uh, task that you have, or even the as DAG at the end of your context manager. You can just use with DAG and remove the as DAG part. It's faster, so it's nicer. Something else is the schedule interval. The schedule interval doesn't exist anymore. It's schedule. Impressive, right? Why it is scheduled? Well, that's because there are four ways of scheduling your data pipelines in Airflow. And one way is not time related. But let's begin with the three first ways. So obviously, you have the current expressions. We all know that at daily, at weekly, and so on. And then you have a time delta object if you want to trigger your DAG every day, or let's say every three days, and so on. But what if you have a more complex schedule? What if you want to schedule your DAG exactly as you want? How can you do that? You can use a timetable. So with the timetable, you have all the freedom that you ever dreamed of to schedule your data pipeline. In fact, in this example, I'm using the events timetable so I can define exactly when I want to schedule my DAG, like if I was using a calendar. And that's the beauty of events table. You have other tables as you have other timetables as well that are pre-built for you. But the point is, if you have complex schedule, then take a look at the timetables. That will be very helpful for you. I'm not saying that they are easy to implement, but they exist. Okay, we are good with the schedule. Let's move on the task definition. This is the exact equivalent of what you saw before with the Python operator. I think we can all agree how easier it is to read and to write. We are engineers. We don't want to take a lot of time to write things. We want to go fast and, if, and be efficient. So we just need to use the decorators, put the functions, your tasks, under the decorators, and you are done. How do you define the dependencies? Well, based on how you share data between your tasks. You can still use you know, the classic bit shift, right shift operators. But you can also use this way based on the way you share your data between your tasks, then that creates the dependencies. It's much easier to read. OK, so we are done with the DAG, almost, obviously. Let's move on. If we zoom in a little bit on the extract from bucket task, 
We want to extract data from a S3 bucket. How can we do that? Well, first thing first, we need to create a connection, isn't it? So we create that connection, and for a while, regardless of the connection type you were using, you had always the same fields. For example, if you were using like AWS, you had the extra field, which expects a JSON input, which is prone to errors. But now, according to the connection type you use, you have specific fields. For example, here, AWS Access Key ID and AWS Secret Access Key. Also, do you see this little button here, test? This is nice, because now you can check your connections. And by the way, this has been disabled uh, in 2.7. You have to enable it again uh, for security reasons. But just keep in mind that now you can check your connections, and this is really cool. OK, so we know how to create a connection. Um, what about the files? In a S3 bucket, maybe you don't know in advance what files you will get. Maybe on Monday, you will get four files. Maybe on Tuesday, you will get five files. You don't know in advance. So how do you, how do you manage that? Because you don't want to create one task that retrieves all the files, because if one file goes wrong, then you will have to retrieve all the files again, and you are wasting time and resources. So in this case, you can use something called dynamic task mapping. We talked about that in the panel, and the purpose of dynamic task mapping is to generate tasks dynamically according to inputs that you don't know in advance. It's not just generating tasks. It's truly based on something that you don't know in advance. So again, if I have five files on Monday, I will get five tasks. If I have six files on Wednesday, I will get six files, six tasks. How to implement that? Pretty easy. You just need to use partial and expand. So you see the function at the bottom, get S3 files. So this function returns a list of values, like a list of file names in this example. And for every file name in that list, that will create the corresponding task. Simple. So you have, a ta you have a function that returns a list of values, and for every value, you will get a task. And partial here is just for the parameters that don't change, that are static, to define your task. OK, imagine that the file names are not correct. You want to change those file names. One way to do it is by calling map to the output of your dynamic tasks or even to uh, you know, like just a classic task. So for example here, we got the file names from uh, the dynamic tasks, and we call map on this list and pass the function we want to apply to every value of that list. And just like that, you are able to modify the output of your tasks pretty easily. OK? OK, so we are done with that part. Um, usually, your DAG will get bigger and bigger, right? And to better read your DAG, to better debug your DAG, you will need to group your tasks together. That's a pretty common thing to do in Airflow. I have a question for you, and you can raise your hand if you want to, but who is using sub-DAGs today? I see, I see like everybody is looking like, who is, who is using sub-DAGs? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy, it's okay. Okay, my point is sub-DAGs, and I'm glad if nobody of you are, are using sub-DAGs anymore, but my point is sub-DAGs are deprecated. You should stop using sub-DAGs definitely because they are very hard just for grouping tasks together. I mean, think of it. You need to create a DAG in a DAG, put your tasks in that DAG, then call you know, that sub-DAG in a specific way and so on. There are so many things to think about just for grouping your tasks together. It's, it was just insane. But this is over because you can use task group instead. As you can see, pretty straightforward. You just call the task group. You put the tasks under that task group, so the group that you want to group together, uh, the tasks that you want to group together, and that's it. And you can even have nested task groups. So you can have a task group in a task group in a task group in a task group in a task group, and so on. I'm not sure if your teammates will be happy about that, but you can do it. And also, um, a reason why so many people were still using sub-DAGs before, it's because there was no way to, of cleaning your tasks you know, at once um, in the group. Now you can do it. Okay, with the task group, on the UI, you will see a button clear, 
and that will clear all the tasks at once. So you can really use task groups. You, you have no reason uh, to use subdags anymore. OK, let's move on. So the extract sources are done. We have this group, and we want to transform the data using dbt. I'm sure that you know dbt. But the point is, for a while, the only option you had was to use the bash operator. And you know that with the bash operator, you had no idea what was going on with your dbt project while you were running it with Airflow. It was, you were blinded. This is over. Cosmos is an open source project that you can use, anybody can use it. And just with Cosmos, you have a better way to integrate dbt into your data pipelines. You see, with the bash operator at the top, you had no idea what was going on in your project. But now, with Cosmos, you can clearly see your dpt project with your models and so on. So if something goes wrong, well, you will get notified because you can leverage the Airflow functionalities for your dbt project. And that's why Cosmos is truly awesome. You will save a lot of time with that. OK, we can say that. Oh, actually, there is a bonus. Yeah. Um, so this one is a new feature in 2.7. You know, um, if you, when you need to transform data, usually you also need to set up and tear down resources. Um, now you can use the setup and tear down tasks for that. Setup and tear down tasks help you to better manage your resources. I won't go into the details here, but the point is you can set up your resources using the setup task, and then if like any task between the setup and the teardown goes wrong, you are sure that the resources will be cleaned at the end, regardless of what happened in between. Okay, that's the beauty of the setup and teardown tasks. And you can clearly see on the UI what tasks are in charge of setting up your resources and cleaning up your resources. So that's a little uh, bonus for you. All right, so we are done with extract sources, transform, and let's assume that we are done with um, the load too. What else can we do? Well, <laughs> again, in the real world, like, I mean, we are almost like a family here. But um, the truth is, your data pipeline is not like that uh, when you, you know, go back to your job. Um, maybe it looks like that. Yeah, I know, it's painful, right? Um, and, <laughs> and obviously, you don't want to debug that. You don't, you don't even want to look at that, right? It's, it's scary. But there is a way to solve that. Um, and this is usually where you start looking for DAG dependencies. So instead of having one giant big DAG, we will have three different data pipelines. One for extracting the data, one for transforming the data, and another one to load the data. But how do we do that? How do we create those DAG dependencies? The external task sensor, you can use it to wait for a task to complete before moving forward in the current DAG. Then you have the trigger DAG on operator, which is just to trigger a DAG from another DAG. But then you have the data sets. And with the data sets, you are able to trigger a DAG based on data updates. So think of a data set as a way to represent your data, like a table or a file and so on. And just like that, you are able to create dependencies between your DAGs based on data updates. So for example, here, my operator, which is a task, updates the following data set, example CSV, that triggers the second DAG that you see at the bottom because it is scheduled on that file. And you can get this beautiful view. You see, load um, is, um, is triggered on transform data, and transform, is, um, transform data is produced by transform, then transform is triggered on extracted data, and extracted data is produced by extract. That's the beauty of data sets. So what else can we do to make our DAGs better? Well, I have three tips for you. The first one is override. If you have a lot of tasks, you know, that do the same thing in your different data pipelines, you can use override. So instead of rewriting the same task again and again for every DAG that you have, you can just have one file, you put your common tasks in that file, and you call override with like a new task ID or a new parameter in every other DAG. 
So for example, here I have a task that requests an API, that requests an API. And in DAG A, I just use override, I change the task ID, I change the API, and that's it. And then I can reuse that, ta that uh, task in my other DAG, and again, I change the task ID and the API. And just like that, you can even build like a library of tasks that you can reuse in different uh, data pipelines. Something else, put labels on your dependencies. Remember the big giant DAG. If you have labels on your dependencies, it will be easier for you to know why your task is executed over another one. This is very helpful, and your teammates will be happy about that too. Last but not least, don't forget to put a documentation about your DAG. I don't want to have diving into the code just to know why, what a DAG does. Okay? This documentation, you will see it on the Airflow UI. You don't want to look into the code just to know what a DAG does. That will help you with yourself and your teammates. Okay, so we are good with the data pipelines. Let's move on. Before running our data pipelines, we still need to verify that the code is up to date. Remember that Airflow takes around 30 seconds to, know, uh, to, to take your code into account. And you can verify that by looking at the parsed at date from the code view. So instead of guessing if your DAG is up to date in Airflow, you can just take a look at this date from the code view. And you will know that the code is the last one or not. Cluster activity, let's make sure that our Airflow instance is up and running and we can trigger our DAGs. So now we can run it. We run our data pipelines, we end up with an issue. And we fix it, we can add nodes. So if you have like special behaviors for your tasks, then it's really nice to put notes to tell to your teammates that, hey, this task is a little bit complex, so you can know about that. Okay, you add notes, everybody else can see it. Then last but not least, this one is very interesting, use notifiers. If you want to get notified if something goes wrong, you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again, you can use notifiers for that. So here we are using the Slack notification, to send a notification to Slack if something goes wrong. There is a list of notifiers that you can use. Don't waste uh, time recreating the wheel. Just go on the documentation and you will see that list of notifiers that you can use for SMTP, etc. And that's it. Just like that, you have built a beautiful, or I would say three beautiful data pipelines, full in best practices with the latest features of Airflow. And now you know exactly what Airflow is able to do today. Thank you, everybody, and it was a wonderful pleasure to have you.